Good evening. Hi, everyone. How fantastic to see so many people. Thank you all for coming on a hot Friday night. My name's Kinvara Balfour, and I am very, very honored to be speaking at the V&A. I have a huge affiliation to this incredible building. When I was young, my grandmother, who's now 93, who I took to the hairdresser this morning around the corner, she would bring me here to the fashion galleries pretty much every Saturday. And we would then go home and sketch what we had seen. And that has had a huge impact on my own life. And I have a huge fondness for everything here. I also use the library to write plays in. It's the only place I can concentrate. So I love this building. And to be here talking and giving a lecture is really a big honor for me. So thank you for being a part of that. We are here today to talk about British fashion. British fashion is at the height of its game and we're going to be discussing who makes it at the height of its game and why. And I'm very, very excited to be joined by two mega British fashion superstars who are going to join me after my slideshow. We have Caroline Rush, the CEO of the British Fashion Council, and Dylan Jones, who's the editor-in-chief of GQ magazine. It's really a huge honour for me to uh, have them here today, so it's going to be great. We're going to start the, the talk with a quick look at some of the big designers who are out there now and why. And first, we're going to watch a film that's come from the BFC to give us a taste of what, what goes on at Fashion Week. And I'm going to click that. Does that work? Up there? We're going to have a film. There we are. It's been absolutely fantastic. I always love coming to London. There's just so many great designers here. Over the next five days, we're going to see the very best of British fashion. London is always full of energy. Lots of great people here and everybody looks amazing. I'm excited to have the first time in London sitting and watching the show instead of being in it. It's nice to actually be back in London and soaking up the fashion of this season. I love London Fashion Week because it is different. London's really relevant. I think they really do set trends and they have amazing designers here. They're really designing from the heart and that comes across so strongly on the runway. Sometimes they might throw a curveball and they're not afraid to kind of push things forward. They never cease to surprise me actually. The British heritage, the culture, the extravagance of the show, the entertainment, it's amazing. If you're up against all these incredible designers, you've got to do something really stand out to get attention. I just never really know what to expect and it keeps changing and getting better in different ways. London is the most daring to be creative and push boundaries. We've got all the different facets that make a very creative country uh, so special. You know, we're all a bit kooky and I think kookiness helps with creativity. You can do or be or say whatever you want and that freedom is unlike anywhere else I've ever been. I think it's the best. is thanks to the British Fashion Council, that film, and it shows their beautiful headquarters now at Somerset House, um, where a lot of the fashion shows take place. Um, I am going to read a quick quote that I got today from the chairman of the BFC, Natalie Massonet, who is a dear friend, someone I really admire, someone I just recently interviewed, actually, at the Apple Store in New York, and someone who is, we will talk with Caroline, partly responsible for this huge emergence that's going on right now. British fashion is globally renowned for being the most creative. London's designers set the trends, push the boundaries, and never fail to excite and ex inspire every season. Over the last decade, an incredible group of London-based designers that we collectively refer to as the new establishment have come to the foreground, grabbing the international headlines around collection time and adorning red carpets across the globe. They offer retailers and consumers something unique standing out in the store and on the street. So let's take a look at some of the big key emerging designers who are out there today. 
I could have chosen about 50, and I have, was constrained by time, so I've chosen my top 13 because it's June the 13th. Um, I will have missed off plenty. I will have missed off some of the bigger names like Tom Ford, Giles Deacon, uh, Burberry, some of these huge British brands. Today we're just going to really look at what we call the new establishment. These are designers who are emerging or emerged and who are on the cusp of really, really big things and big global domination in my opinion. So Huishan Zhang, a lovely, lovely man. I actually awarded last year to Huishan uh, the Dorchester Collection Fashion Prize. He was so gracious and so kind. He's born in China. He studied at Central St. Martins. And his inspiration is the Chong Sam, the traditional Chinese dress, which he basically changes and switches up with lots of embellishment and texture. And he is doing big things. Angelica Chung, who's the editor of America, uh, even Chinese Vogue, is a huge supporter of Huishan, and he's growing really on, on both sides in both countries at a, at a very fast speed. So you'll be seeing a lot of him. Michael van der Ham, a lovely man, born in the Netherlands, also studied at Central St. Martins. I will just touch upon the fact that a lot of the designers I'm going to talk about have studied at the Royal College of Art and Central St. Martins, two incredible schools who train people from all over the world, and it's a huge, huge coup for England to have that. One of the key people who, would, who taught all these people is Professor Louise Wilson, who sadly passed away uh, very recently. And, and it's just worth talking about her now, because her work, um, she worked tirelessly and taught a lot of these designers and was really a force of nature. And anyone who studied under her will tell you that she was indefatigable, very, very opinionated, very directive, and had a huge influence on their work. And as a country, as, a, as Britain, we have a lot to thank her for. So Michael van der Ham, trained at Central St. Martins. He worked for Alexander McQueen and Sophia Kokosalaki, who's a Greek-born British designer. And he's now one of the big names on the catwalk calendar. His work is all into mis mis uh, mismatch fabrics, unusual cuts, and mixed textures. And as you can see, for British fashion, everything now is very, very complex. There's more money, there's more support, there's more training. Designers now are really showing some very complex, very luxurious work. And they're able to do that because there's more money behind them, more training behind them, and, and a bigger consumer base. So they have more to play with, which is very, very important. Amelia Wickstead, British, now has a huge store on Pont Street, which is really a coup for an English designer. It's very hard. Ten years ago, British designers were not able to have these big boutiques like they do now. Emilio also trained at Central St. Martins, and her clothes are very traditional, very classic, but with huge bright colour. I was actually at Chilton Firehouse restaurant last night, which is a fun place to be, and all the staff are wearing Emilia Wickstead pantsuits and trouser suits, and I just think that's just such a great idea and such a brilliant example of how fashion is really infiltrating all areas of culture now. And, and I think it's really merging with so much more than just the fashion crowd. Fashion is for everyone. It's not just for fashion industry. So Amelia's work, very pared down, very classical, but with a real twist. And she plays a lot with color. She has a huge customer database, as do all these people. I mean, the likes of Hollywood, Samantha Cameron, uh, all sorts of people are now really buying all these clothes. Holly Fulton, a Scottish girl, went to Edinburgh, went to the Edinburgh College of Art, and then went to the Royal College of Art. And one of the key players at the Royal College of Art is Professor Wendy Dagworthy, who is also has a huge influence on British fashion today and really deserves a lot of credit for what she's done. Holly's known for her real graphic prints, and um, it's very simple but fantastic graphic detail, very young, very edgy, and she's one of the real emerging names of the moment. Osman, Osman Yusuf Zada is, uh, where's he from? Well, he is British, I don't know, I think he's from somewhere else originally. He also went to St. Martin's, a lovely man. His clothes are very, very popular with the art crowd here in London. Um, and again, it's, it's the same thing, really complex tailoring, a mixture of textures, a mixture of fabrics. He's an incredibly nice man and has a very, very loyal following. 
Roxanne de just opened a store on Mount Street two nights ago. Congratulations to her again. That's a very big thing. It's all very well for someone like Victoria Beckham or Roland Murray to design clothes in this country, but for them all to open proper boutiques in Mayfair, bricks and mortar, that's a really, really big accolade for the British fashion industry. And long may it continue. Roxanne is clothes, she's very much into her block colours, block prints. It's a kind of sporty edge, still very striking, very feminine. And Roxanne is Serbian born, but considers herself as an English designer. She also trained at Central St. Martins. And uh, good luck to her with her new shop, because I think she will do incredibly well. Jonathan Saunders, a Scotsman, went to Glasgow School of Art and then also to Central St. Martins. He worked for McQueen, Lacroix, and Chloe under Phoebe Filer before he decided to set up his own label. He, we have tomorrow starting the London Collections Men, which is the new menswear collections, which are huge now in London, and we're going to be talking a lot about that with Dylan now, who's very kindly taken time out of his very busy schedule to join us. And a lot of the famous women's wear designers now are also showing menswear. And they're not only doing that, but they're doing it in London. Milan used to be the real capital of menswear, and now London is pretty much overtaking it, or overtaking it, I should say, if Dylan's here. And Jonathan is one of those people who's as big on the menswear catwalk as he is on the women's wear catwalk, and that's fantastic for England, because we have all that tailoring know-how, we have the Savile Row heritage, and it's time that we really, really took that onto the catwalk. Marius Schwab, Marius is, he would consider himself Greco-Austrian, and he went to Esmod School in Berlin and then did his MA at Central St. Martins. He's a, a really key player. He has a kind of Greek influence going on with, with a lot of rap drapery, toga-style drapery, and then some kind of real 80s goth going on as well. His clothes are very, very simple, but very, very complex. And if you look at them close up, as with all these dresses and uh, clothes, there's, is there's so much complexity going on underneath. And there's such an intelligence there and I think that's a lot to do with the schools that, that we have in this country. Christopher Kane, a Scotsman, works very closely alongside, alongside his sister Tammy Kane. Together they've created a huge, huge label. And Christopher was recently bought, well, co-bought 51% by the Corinne Group, which used to be PPR, which is one of the big luxury conglomerates. And that's incredible for a British designer and for one who actually started quite recently in, in the big scale of things. He also was taken on by Versace to do Atelier Versace for them, which is a huge accolade. And he will go far. He, we've chosen all his menswear. He shows women's wear as well, but he's a big name now on the menswear calendar. And that's, that's just fantastic um, for everyone involved. He's incredibly talented. I remember going to his first show, which was unforgettable and got everybody talking. And you really, really felt that there was something really special taking place. And he has consistently produced different collections season after season with really, it's, nothing is repeated, everything is original, his ideas are unique. And he really is a very, very big name to watch. David Comer, he's from Georgia. He then lived in St. Petersburg. He did both his BA and MA at Central St. Martins. And he's David Combe is being worn by so many people on the red carpet right now. It's incredible. America's gone mad about him. His clothes are very, very clean, very, very, very well structured with a kind of gothic medieval edge. Again, with all these designers, it's very hard to define what they do because they recreate and redefine what they do every season. And that's what makes it all very exciting and that's what makes it so commercial and that's what makes it so fantastic that places like Harrods and Harvey Nichols and net a and all those places consistently buy and buy and buy these collections because they're always fresh, the ideas are always new. And, and that's why everyone's doing so incredibly well. Erdem is a Canadian. He was born in Montreal and now considers himself a Brit. And he went to the Royal College of Art. His clothes are worn by pretty much everyone. Um, all very, very feminine, with huge attention to detail, great sense of, uh, well, there's a lot of sheer going on, a lot of embroidery, a lot of embellishment, but it's still very feminine and very soft. And Erdem, again, is one of the real key big players now on, the, on a global scale. And um, no doubt before, one of these luxury brands jump on him as well. 
Peter Pilotto, that's actually two people. Christopher DeVos is on the left and Peter Pilotto is on the right. Two incredibly nice men. Uh, Peter is half Austrian and half Italian. Christopher is half Belgian and half, ooh, I should know that, Peruvian. They're incredibly nice, very gracious, very humble duo. They met at, in Antwerp in Belgium at the Royal Academy of Fine Arts and have really, really taken England and the world by storm with their colourful, digital, bold prints. They produce these different prints every season that are just fantastic, and they come with structure and shape as well. And they're really pushing the boundaries, and they're really, uh, really creating headlines. And again, their clothes now are really a given on the red carpet, which is a big, big deal, because they haven't been around for that many seasons. If you think a lot of these designers who compete for the red carpet or compete for whichever else, whatever the catwalk we call in real life. A lot of these designers in America or the big luxury brands, they have a lot of money in order to, to spend in order to get their clothes on these style icons and role models. A designer who has a little less of a budget, who manages to get that and get that accolade, it's a huge deal for them. And we're seeing this more and more in England with all our British designers. And it, and it really does have an impact and it's something to be really, really proud of. And then finally, Mary Katransu. Mary is Greek-born. Mary also studied at St. Martin's. She, did, um, she went to Rhode Island School of Design. She then did a BA and then an MA at Central St. Martin's. And Louise Wilson taught her. I recently interviewed Mary in the Apple Store. Um, and Louise gave an amazing quote about how erudite she was and what a hard worker she was and how she was going to succeed, um, not just for, for now, but for always. And I spoke to Mary. And actually, it was really interesting to talk to Mary about how hard she works to do what she does. And we joked about how she used to sleep in her studio and she would just sleep on bubble wrap because she didn't have time to go home. And, and th that really represents what all these people do. It's incredibly hard work and they all are incredibly diligent, but they're really, really seeing the rewards for their hard work. Mary used to work for Sophia Kokosalaki and Bill Blass before she set up her own label. And she's also one of the first to have launched her own e-commerce business, which is quite new. A lot of these designers are sold through I would I'll say Net-a-Porter because it's global, but all sorts of global e-commerce sites and all sorts of department stores around the world. Um, but we are seeing a big shift now. If they can manage that and do that, then a lot of these designers are starting to set up their own e-commerce boutiques, which is a big thing because you can, that means they're open now to countries around the world. And that's very important, so we must learn to support them in that, on that digital side. Mary's very, very brilliant at the digital as much as she is at the creative, and that's what really sets her apart. Her work is all about digital print. She's one of the first people to use 3D printing in fashion, um, and not the last. Her work is copied all over the world, actually, and she reinvents the wheel every season and is incredibly nice as she does it and has a very, very loyal following of people around the world. And uh, if you ever come across her, you will see what a great big heart she has, and she really is a national treasure, as are all these people. That's 13 only of our top new establishment in Britain. I have at least, I mean, there's 20 more on that level, let alone we've got someone like Tom Ford, who now shows in this country, which is a huge deal for us. I interviewed Tom the other day, and I said, you live in London, you're an American man. Do you consider yourself an American or an English designer? And he said, I consider myself a global designer. I don't consider myself that I'm affiliated to any country. He said, I show in London because it's been made incredibly easy for him to do so, and he's been given the support. But his world, his shops, his digital media, they appeal to the world, and I think that's what designers now have to do and what they are all learning to do. With it, like any company, you have to be, you are a global designer, not just a British designer. Likewise, I will touch upon Burberry. Burberry is an incredible brand run by Christopher Bailey, and also Angela Ahrens, who's just left to go to Apple. And together they made a brand that was so, is so global. And they've worked so hard to uh, bring that to the masses around the world with digital live streaming. They're the first to live stream their show. They now show in London for women's wear and men's wear. And that's a big, big honor for London. And we're going to talk with Dylan a little bit more about that. So I am now going to welcome Dylan and Caroline on stage. We're going to talk a little bit, and then we're going to open up for Q&A so that you can ask either of them anything you'd like to ask. So please, Dylan and Caroline, come and join me. Have you got some water? Yeah, we've got some water. OK. 
Okay, great. So we have Caroline, CEO of the British Fashion Council, and Dylan, editor-in-chief of GQ magazine. Both are incredibly busy because Men's Fashion Week starts tomorrow morning, 9 a.m., and goes on for five days, four days. And so they're, they're, they're right in it. I want to start first and just talk about the British Fashion Council itself. What does the British Fashion Council do, and why is it doing everything so much, so brilliantly? Well, I think we're probably best known for organising London Fashion Week, now organising London Collections Men, which is our Men's Fashion Week, which has now been going for two years, and the British Fashion Awards. But behind the scenes, we do a lot of industry work. Um, we spend a lot of time mentoring young designers, um, helping them uh, commercialise their creativity, um, but bringing together the industry and, um, and addressing the challenges and the opportunities that are coming along at the same time time. Okay. okay, so we have London Fashion Week, which is the women's collections twice a year, and then we have LCM, London Collections Men, which Dylan is the chairman of. Take us through wh why menswear, how did that get so big? Who sat down and decided, let's make menswear the big, London so big for menswear? Well, I think it, it's, um, it was decided by the designers themselves. I think that uh, the most important thing about LCM is that we have a generation of designers who really warrant that platform. Uh, and London Collections Men starts tomorrow. There's a hundred events in three and a half days, and that's grown in five seasons. And that's only happened because of the wealth of talent uh, we have here. I mean, you, you mentioned all those designers earlier. Yes, um, I've missed a lot of menswear ones. No, 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 no. I, I was, I was, I was going to say that a lot of them are not from London, but London demands t t talent. And I think that the... Um, the bar is higher in London than it is in any other capital because there's so much creativity here. And why do you think, why is it, what is it? I mean, we've always had talent, but why now? Do you think it is to do with the schools? Do you think it is to do with the fact that the government's funding more? Is it just a mood in the air? Or is it the fact that we're such a global melting pot now, this, this capital, that we've got so much more influence? I think it's to do with the fact that all these designers, all the people up there and all the ones showing over the next three, three days at London Collection as men are all incredibly business savvy. Back in the 80s, you had a lot of amazing designers. You had Catherine Hamnett, you had Body Map, you had John Galliano, Stephen Linnard, Fiona Dealey, all these extraordinary people. But this generation really understand that they have the uh, ability to make businesses. Because tw 20 years ago, the likes of the people you just mentioned would wait to be picked up by a big French or Italian conglomerate. And now they understand that they actually stay in London and build real businesses. And also, I suppose, the fact that we now sell online to a global audience makes people much more aware of a label much quicker around the world, rather than it being just in Browns or just in Barneys or Bergdorf Goodman. With the British Fashion Council, how do you nurture this many names? I mean, I really could have gone on and on. And you do nurture them, and you're almost sort of fostering that talent. How do you manage that, and who do you choose to foster? Well, we work very closely with industry to help, um, I guess, select the winners. And the way we look at it, we almost have um, a pyramid of support, where right at the very top are the designers that we select to go through. We have a scheme called New Gen, which is pretty much for startup businesses, maybe have got one collection under their belt, are thinking about showing at London Fashion Week or London Collections Men. And um, if they get selected for that scheme, uh, they have the opportunity to either do a presentation, to do a show, but they also get support to look at, have they registered their business, uh, have they registered for VAT, do uh, they have a good relationship with their bank manager, you know, the nuts and bolts of building a business. And I think um, from that stage onwards, we look at uh, different levels of mentoring at each stage in their business. So it means that uh, we're helping them grow with their business and grow their knowledge at the same time. And they are all for that, they have to be British, doesn't, I mean, they're not British people, but they have to show in Britain, they have to show in London, I mean, there's, there's sort of it's a quid pro quo, right? It is. They have to show here. So the, the only criteria really is that your head office is here. Um, you don't have to have studied here, but your head office is here and you have to show in London as well. Okay, and for LCM, so now we've got LCM and we've got all these catwalk shows. Have we just suddenly grown a whole bunch of new menswear designers from England that we didn't have before? Or are people kind of migrating from Milan back home? Or 
Where have they all come from? Well, one of the um, important things about the success of London Collections Men is that it's not just a platform, as you say, for all the designers who are based here, but it was very important for us to reach out to those British designers who had previously shown abroad, like Burberry, like Alexander McQueen, like Hackett, like Dunhill, like Paul Smith, and all these people, and encourage them to come back to London, which they've done. Also, why, why did they show abroad? Because I think a lot of because people they had no because, because there was no platform in London. Okay. Uh, and uh, realistically, you need to show your shows, uh, your, your clothes. And if you can't do it in London, you'll do it in Paris or Milan. And the other important um, thing to do was to try and encourage other designers, particularly American designers, to move and show in London. And we've had tremendous support from the likes of Calvin Klein and Tom Ford, as you mentioned, and Tommy Hilfiger, Donna Karen showing DKNY here this weekend. So all of that stuff's yeah, fantastic. It's really amazing for us to have that back in England. It's amazing. How do you, um, as an editor, how have you seen the fashion landscape change? Uh, you've been at GQ for how many years? Since God was a boy. Since God, okay. <laughs> Not that long then. Um, how have you seen it change? Have you seen everybody get more commercial or have you just, has it changed with the BFC? Are you seeing everything being much more commercial, much more professional? Or is it just a constant flow of creativity? It, it's all grown. Consumer interest has grown. Where men are concerned, they're much more sophisticated consumers now. Uh, this generation of, of men, uh, they, they shop more like women, they're more interested in clothes, there's no qualms about shopping, there are more great designers, there's a better business environment, fantastic support from the likes of the BFC. Um, so it's a, sort of, it's a kind of perfect storm, I think. And you actually went to St. Martin's, didn't you, originally? I did, actually, yeah. Was it, was it fun or was it as scary as they make it out to be? Uh, I went there because, um, no, I won't tell you why I went there, actually. <laughs> but, um, uh, no, it's a fantastic college. It is the best college in the world for fashion, which is why there's such a premium um, for the summer courses, which are all taken up by Chinese and American students, because it's simply the best place to study. Who is behind that? Who's supporting that? I mean, is it the, go the government aware? <laughs> um, the government, I don't think, actually do enough. They could do a lot more. But... Um, is that you, you asked the question earlier, is that why do we have so much talent here? And I think it is because in the UK is fashion's tour to art colleges and uh, those lecturers very much focus on creativity, whereas our counterparts in the United States focus probably more on the business side and bringing creativity through, but it's very much about building a business and building an empire and building a brand. And um, the designers that come through our colleges come out with a real uh, passion and urge for, for creation. And, um, and that's the starting point for their brand. And that's where we pick up and help them with the business to develop. And I think that's an incredible USP to have. And it gives us real strength and a, a great platform to help grow this industry. And will you touch upon a little bit about the, what we call the showrooms, which is where you take designers around the world and you essentially pay for that, the BFC pays for that, and you introduce the designers to the stylists in LA, to the, show, to the shops in Paris. What's that for and how do you manage that? Well, we're very lucky. I'd like to say that we pay for it, is that it's all um, sponsorship funded. So we're constantly going out and talking to brands and a little bit to like government. Vertu or whoever, Coots, Vertu, I mean, all those big... Exactly, and uh, yeah. retailers to put some money in to help us do it. And I think um, it's an incredibly generous industry, actually. And lots of individuals give back through mentoring, but um, they also believe in giving back and supporting the opportunities for designers to meet new people. Um, and the showrooms in different territories have different um, rationales. So in Paris, it's all about sales. It's all about uh, writing those orders. Um, and as you said, when we go to LA, it's really about finding an opportunity to find a connection with those celebrity stylists, with sometimes the celebrities themselves, of getting the dresses on the red carpet and starting that momentum, which creates a demand when they don't have advertising budgets. It's a brilliant way to get stand out. Yeah, I saw something the other day that Mary Katransu had put that in Us Weekly there was a, a sort of Mary Katransu page of some of the biggest top A-listers in the world are all wearing Mary Katransu. Now that's a huge honour and it's a big deal for British fashion and I suppose 20 years ago it wasn't that heard of that a kind of an emerging British designer would have that much clout. But I suppose by introducing those brands in that way everyone's jumping for it. It's just about getting it there. 
Yes, and I think from the um, celebrities' point of view, they're building their own brand, and the affiliation and association with British designers gives them that point of difference. It helps them uh, make a statement about their own creativity, and um, of course, they also look great. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And um, if that now there is so much talent, and that talent has been given an incredible platform for emerging emerging designers and new designers who are starting out today, I want to ask you both, as a magazine editor. How does someone stand out? How do you choose what you're putting in your magazine when there is so much talent across the board? And how would you get selected to appear or show in London Fashion Week? How are people going to stand out now when there is so much talent? Well, I think that um, uh, the easiest way to answer that is to talk about our uh, GQ BFC menswear fund, which we um, we announced the first winner on Monday, supported by Vertu. The winner was Christopher Shannon. Uh, a brilliant designer, uh, and he gets £200,000 over the next year, including mentoring from Vertu and various other people, to get his business to the next stage. Uh, and that's what we can do, uh, because a lot of these people um, need financial help, and they need um, getting to the next stage, because although there's enormous creativity in this country and there's more money to support them than ever before, as Caroline says, the government is not that supportive and we don't have the sort of vertical systems they do in Italy. And although Italy perhaps doesn't have the creativity that we do here, they certainly have a more integrated um, production system. Okay. okay. And in terms of being an editor on a magazine and essentially overseeing what appears in your pages, are you, are you always on the lookout for the next new underground person? Is that, I mean, that's what magazines are for? Or are you so overloaded with already our emerging names and, our big, and the big names and the advertisers? Or is there room for everyone? There is room for everyone. And we're not necessarily looking for uh, um, the latest avant-garde designer. We're looking for people with proper traction who are going to build businesses and who have a real relationship with customers. Can we quickly say a couple of, well, four or five of the big, of the men's names that are going to be showing this week? Because I feel that I haven't represented them enough, and they really do <laughs> deserve it. Christopher Shannon being one of them who just won the fund. Yeah, we've got Christopher Shannon, we've got Jonathan Saunders, we've got the likes of Richard James, we've got over a dozen Savile Road um, uh, designers, tailors showing. Right. Um, we've got, I mean, we've got over a hundred events, everyone from the likes Nicholas of Nicholas Kirkwood. Hmm? Shall I just shout some more through? <laughs> Nicholas Kirkwood, Richard Nichols, yeah. Aggie and Sam, <laughs> Tom Ford. Okay, and also, before we, go, before we go back to the busy, with Burberry, can we just explain Burberry as a sort of quick, quick case study? What is Burberry doing? I am wearing Burberry, so I know what they're doing, right? Because they have the most incredible customer service and really lovely clothes. But the fact that they live stream their shows, the fact that they're doing all of this, is that setting a precedent for other designers? Is everyone following suit? Has Britain got a part to play in that, or is that purely Christopher Bailey's imagination and genius? Christopher is um, a genius, and, um, and he is very much leading the way. And I think uh, where he's really taking leadership is that idea of connecting with a customer in a different way. So it's not just about selling a product direct to a person. It's about getting into their life. It's creating the Burberry world. And um, they are, of course, this enormous brand, but they're very good at connecting in local markets and finding local champions and ambassadors. And that customization that I think is... Uh, starting to become the norm for global brands, but I think Burberry were very much the leaders in that field. It is fantastic to drive past Kensington Gardens and see another chic white Burberry tent and just feel the presence of the fun and the luxury of it all. Okay, so I'm going to open up for Q&A in a second, but it, just to go back. So for, an, for a magazine, yes, you find that you, you have to stand out from the crowd. To, to show on the London Fashion Week schedule or to get some support from the BFC, if you are a new designer, you've just left Fashion College, how do you get your attention? So there's a, a formal process, you have to apply, and you then go past a panel of retailers, media, and of course some of our team as well. And when you see, we get inundated hundreds and hundreds of applications, and realistically we can probably only allocate one or two uh, slots on the show schedule to allow a new business to show, so there's so much competition there. Um, but when you see all of this, these collections coming through, you see lots of great opportunity, lots of great opportunity for commercial businesses. But what we look for, and I think back to that USP of London, is something that really stands out and something that has that extra uh, special um, 
and it's hard to be able to put something tangible on it, but you certainly see something that stands out that has an opportunity to grow and develop and become a brand. And then it's really exciting. And then it's really exciting. Well, thank you. Okay, well, we're going to open up for the audience Q&A. You can ask Dylan or Caroline or, or myself any question that you want. If you want to ask questions, raise your hand and someone will bring you a microphone, I think. Will they? Yes, they will. So if you raise your hand, uh, the lights are going up so we can see. Um, raise your hand and stand or sit at whatever you feel comfortable with. <clears throat> I have a lady at the back. Hello. Thank you very much for taking the time to give this lecture tonight. It was very interesting. I just have one question. Why is there not more female talent being pushed up? Somehow it's, it feels as if we're very far away from equality when it comes to gender in design, be it menswear or women's wear. Why is there not more women doing it? Is there just no talent in the women or what is the problem? I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that's true. You look at two of the biggest stars of LCM, you've got Lou Dalton, Katie Erie, fantastic talent. And actually I would say, I mean, Caroline would know the percentages perhaps better than me, but I would say the perception in the industry is that there is no uh, issue with gender at all, and there are many, as many great female designers as there are male designers. Yeah, I mean, I think there, there's probably a perception there are, um, in our new establishment, is that there are more men than women at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, but you look at Sarah Burton, Stella McCartney, Phoebe Philo, uh, there are some great role models, I think, to come through. And uh, the likes of Roxanda and Mary really hold their own. And I think in the fashion industry, it's interesting because it's all about entrepreneurship and maybe there's something there about um, really instilling in young women the opportunity to go out there and be entrepreneurs and to compete. Thank you. I was also was going to add Anya Hindmarch into the mix as well, who's not a catwalk designer but had a catwalk show for the first time this season very successfully and is one of the biggest British brands ever and she's just fantastic and an incredible role model, but, but really paving the way, isn't she, in the accessories world? So she's a name. I probably could have put her up there, but she's sort of not emerging. That's the problem. There's a lot of people who are beyond emerging, but are still fascinating. So that's another talk we should do. The Emerged, part two. Come back for another one next week. Okay. Do we have any more questions? I saw, yeah, a lady here in the white top. Hi there. Um, just going back to the point of colleges, I study at the College of Condé Nast, which is the newly opened fashion and business design school. And just so adding that to the likes of Central St Martins and Lo London College of Fashion and the Royal Academy of Arts, um, you know, you've got this growth in London like no, like no other city in the world. So in 10 or even five years time, where do you all see London fashion heading? Uh, I think it's only going to get bigger, frankly. I think that the... The most important thing, uh, in, um, from my point of view, is the growth of menswear because menswear in this country has grown something like 20% in the last five years. It's, uh, the industry in this country alone is worth close to £13 billion pounds a year. Uh, that creates That's incredible. More, yeah. That is incredible. It creates more jobs, and I think the one of the great things about the college that you're at, Condé Nast, which is the, the the company that owns GQ, is that it's encouraging people not just to be fashion designers, but you can be a PR, you can be production, hair, makeup, photography, all of these ancillary industries which are all incredibly creative, and just feed the industry. And um, if you're going to do it anyway, you're going to do it in London. I think also we, in, in fashion we, we have the on schedule and then we have the off schedule where emerging and emerged and really new designers can choose to show on their own way and I'm sure we'll get that kind of subplot coming with the men's as well and that will just continue to grow and grow and grow because everyone, everyone can have a show, right? Anyone's entitled to have a show, whether they get it funded by the BFC or by one of the sponsors or not is a different matter. But I think that we'll probably see more car park shows and crazy shows. And I also think we'll see more of the live streaming so that we, as the public, can enjoy these shows much more. I mean, Burberry now, you know, you get an invitation into your email inbox going, please join us at our men's show Tuesday, 2 p.m. And, and, and I will be tuning in and I will be watching it if I'm not sitting in the tent and watching it. And I think that that will really, really, really have a huge impact. And Fashion Week now will be for everyone. And you can watch that around the world. Burberry also stream it in their stores. They'll have special guest 
uh, events around the show. But I think as more and more people to do that, more and more designers will realize they can reach such a global audience that they will kind of cluster around that time. Do you agree? I do, and I think um, uh, alongside live streaming, you also have these constant streams through social media, which are allowing uh, particularly the young designers to connect directly with their audience. Uh, so whilst, of course, they um, understand that the magazines have a, a very valid role in doing the edit and really being uh, those that curate the very best of fashion, is what it enables them to do is build their own fan bases, to share with them everything from uh, the creation, the craftsmanship and the product right through to uh, the inspiration to the street style and people wearing it. And I think that's creating a great deal of demand and there's a lot of content out there. And uh, the opportunity and the interest um, in the industry is how do you really galvanize all of that content uh, to be able to make it commercially viable for your business. And I think that's where Burberry have got it right. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, we had more questions I saw in the front. Um, one up the gentleman at the middle. Hi, yes, thank you very much for coming out tonight. It's, uh, it's all very interesting. Just wondered if you could talk um, a little bit more specifically about the investment in fashion. If you're a young designer and you have a fantastic product, a great vision, and uh, you know where you want to go, but you don't have any money, how uh, could you talk a little bit more on specific small investments, how to go about getting those? And um, obviously that's, like you say, it's all money permitting, isn't it? Yeah, um, well, it's, it's exactly the same as any startup or any uh, new venture. And there are lots of um, angel investors out there. And I think the work that we're doing at the moment is trying to demystify for some of those angel investors um, what it means to invest in fashion and de-risk it. And um, uh, we've done several reports that demonstrates that investing in fashion is no riskier than investing in any other startup. It's about finding the right product and believing that there's a market out there and that the routes to market are viable ones. Um, we're seeing a lot of investment from the bigger luxury groups for some of our businesses that are more established, but um, that also is generating a lot of interest in the sector for those that might want to invest at a slightly earlier level. Um, so uh, certainly just keep talking to people and um, and you can of course contact us very happy to put you in touch so with some of those um, investor networks relevant to go through the british film uh, sorry fashion council and that that um, that advice is there we can there's um, a, a short guide on our website actually which sort of aims to very quickly demystify investment for designer businesses um, and um, if there's not on that already then i will make sure that there's also some links to some of these um, angel investor groups or maybe try and speak to you for five minutes outside afterwards <laughs> that's, that's not allowed because she's on strict orders of being downstairs at 8 o'clock on the dot. And that's my responsibility, so I'm not allowed to do that. But I, I, I have to say, having I, I was on the selection committee for, the, for London Fashion Week a, a long time ago, and I've worked with the BFC in various parts, and I've hosted a couple of things with the showrooms, and I cannot... I'm so amazed how present and how helpful they are. It's kind of like an advice bureau, stroke therapist, stroke business corporation. It's kind of amazing. I think we should really touch upon that because that's actually got a lot, <laughs> there's a lot to be said for that. Everyone's very present and, and you're all very much there and I think that's, you know, no one should forget that. It, it, it is a resource and there's a lot of you yeah. with a lot of experience. There is. There's a lot of experience within our organisation, but I think we recognise that um, there are also a lot of businesses out there that probably need some support. So what we're trying to do is a lot of the mentoring sessions that we do or the seminars is to try and distill those into online guides. So you'll see over the next... Um, hopefully eight, uh, maybe 12 months, is that uh, these series coming online that hopefully will help share the broader knowledge that we have uh, that we might not have the time to spend with all of the incredible businesses that we have in this country so that they're sharing with that knowledge as well. And we have to remember as well, whether it's women's wear or men's wear, there are plenty of designers who are funded for one season and are on a roll and then it's harder the next season and they still continue. So it's not a give, it's not, 
you don't just arrive, get the funding, and then you're done for the next 10 years, is it? It's, it's season by season. It is, and I think it's something to remember, is that um, you don't go into the fashion industry, I don't think, to be famous as a designer. You go in because you have the love of creation and product. And it is a slow burn in building a brand. It can take many, many years. And, of course, um, there are some that are able to do it quicker because uh, of the luck of fate and timing and knowing and see, meeting the right people. But generally, is that it does take a long period of time and uh, it's about creation of that DNA and building um, I guess the confidence of the fashion industry and consumers in that brand that helps create the value in it uh, but it's very rewarding we spend a lot of time seeing those businesses go from strength to strength and that's the reason why we get up in the morning and we love our jobs so much and why we wear all their clothes okay I think okay, we've got time for a couple more I, there's one right at the back um, if you can do a sprint Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Alice. Um, I was just wondering, you talked about uh, how you could support kind of fashion designers in the traditional way. Um, so people who've done Central St. Martin's MAs or various other art courses. Um, and kind of for such a creative industry, it seems like there's quite a regimented process. You kind of, you do your MA, you try and get into London Fashion Week, you show. Um, is there any kind of flexibility in the support you offer for people who are perhaps trying to kind of approach fashion design in a new way? Um, there's quite a big fashion tech uh, movement at the moment and technology is really, really big. And I kind of think uh, my sister and I are actually trying to start a business that approaches fashion in a completely new way. And we wonder if there might be any kind of flexibility um, in, in the way you might help kind of new fashion businesses that are doing it in a new way? The, um, the business models are changing all the time, which is making this industry incredibly exciting. And uh, Kinvara touched on that obviously e-commerce is driving a lot of that, is that a lot of the business that historically would have gone down the wholesale route then think about their own retail, are now going direct to consumer through e-commerce. And, um, and that's exciting to see. But it, it's also tough, is that you would think that it would be incredibly easy. You set up a store, you get a fan base. But again, is that it's thinking about where you're going to be in 10 years' time, how you're going to build that brand, how it's going to evolve as a business. Um, and there is, you're right, particularly in London, there are some really great successful fashion tech stories. And we're working quite closely with Google and Facebook and Twitter at the moment to look at maybe how we can better support some of those businesses in ways um, that we don't at the moment. Do you agree, Dylan? Is there more tech fashion link-ups than you're in the men's world as well? Magazine. I, I, I think in terms of media, there's obviously more uh, there's more support and there are more avenues than ever before because we live in a digital age. However, if you're talking about print, which is a part of the sector which is in many, se is in many parts um, staggering, but not in the fashion world, you walk into Selfridges and there are more fashion magazines than you've ever seen in your life. Right. Uh, and they're all good, they've all got good photographers in them, they've all got some contrary art piece, they're all well designed. Um, I mean, it's a cottage industry, it's not a big industry, but the opportunities for young designers to get their work featured in print or in a digital form is easier now than it's ever been. Okay, okay. thank you. Right, one more question. We have one uh, person just at the back, a lady there. Oh, I'm on. okay, we'll, two, we'll do two quick, and then, then, yeah, we're, then I'm going to get told off. Okay. okay. So you talk about a rise in British fashion, but have you seen a rise in British manufacturing again? And the made in Britain and England? Um, I don't know if you had a chance, there was um, uh, an exhibition actually over at the Truman Brewery in the East End this week, which was all about British made product. And it was great to see that there are some really good news stories out there. Um, we're looking at a manufacturing project at the moment to look at what the real economic opportunity is to bring manufacturing back and to hopefully prove that there's a really great argument for investment in the sector. Uh, for a lot of our younger designers, they all manufacture here. It's on their doorstep, most of it in and around the M25. But the challenge is for those units, in the same way as for the designer businesses, is finding the skills, the finance to be able to grow. Okay, and then we have one last one just up there. Thank you. Oh, great. Well, then, that's great.
Okay, well then, on that note, I'd just like to thank you all for coming. Thank you so much. And also thank you so much to Caroline and Dylan. It's a real honor for me to have them here. Good luck with the next few days. Get your beauty sleep tonight. And thank you very, very much, everyone, for coming here today. Thank you. Thank you.